Great. Uh, I'm Matt Peterson. I work in the office of the CTO. Um, I'm one of the first um, non-kernel developers. I've been at Cumulus for almost two and a half years. Uh, my background um, is more on deploying networks, not writing protocols and, and making uh, folks as, as, as Dinesh was doing. Um, we're running a little short on time, but uh, when you guys walked in today, you saw a rack with some servers and some switches. And what we're demonstrating there is something we call um, kind of OpenStack on a box. That's one of the solution guides that uh, Dinesh and uh, JR had mentioned where you can download a, uh, basically a zip file or a tarball, put it on a USB stick, wire it up according to the, um, the documentation, fire it, uh, fire it on, and then this gets blasted out not only to the switches, but also to the compute devices. So we try to make that kind of soup to nuts example um, very easy to consume. Uh, this uses uh, NovaNet. Um, if you're familiar with uh, OpenStack, um, when it comes to high availability, even in the latest release, there really isn't high availability. Um, so kind of best of breed across uh, different vendors in the OpenStack space is still using VLANs and uh, uh, you know, basic layer two networks. We're trying to get them to use overlays like VXLAN and routing. Um, but as you can imagine, um, the OpenStack community is not very friendly to traditional networking companies or startups. We're trying to get away from networking companies. So it's been a slow, slow roll, but they're finally coming around to uh, adopting routing. So that's the, the demo that's running outside. And what's happening here is there's a Spino 1's already been installed, and then Spino 2, the second switch, is going through this installation process. So it, it went through Oni, uh, Oni came up and uh, is now installing the operating system, and then that will run um, throughout my talk and hopefully uh, finish in time. So as I mentioned, uh, I'm more on the uh, customer facing side. We like to joke that, um, you know, JR and uh, Dinesh and sometimes Nolan, they spend a lot of time doing golf and helicopters. And we spend a lot of time actually interacting with customers and, and getting networks into production. So my background is, is a mixture of those Web 2.0 uh, organizations that are very hip to using these DevOps tools to NGOs that are very um, conservative to not using any of those tools that don't fall within their, uh, their compliance requirements. Um, I also do a temporary event in the desert every year. I do an internet exchange. So I have a pretty big, big background on both layer two, layer three, uh, kind of all up the stack, if you will. So I want to talk a little bit about the cultural perspective. You know, when I started at Cumulus, one of the challenges is that a lot of people like the frame us as, well, you either far to the left, meaning that you like to use these DevOps tools and Ansible is going to solve all the world's problems, or you're far to the right and you're a CLI jockey and you want to cut and paste commands from Notepad. And I think both of those extremes are really not valid. There's a happy medium. And so that's what we focus on doing on my part of the organization. When I started in, in networking, it was uh, everything was a silo. Right? We had an Oracle database administrator. We had an EMC NetApp storage administrator. We had a tools developer that knew M4 and Make and CF Engine, right? All those things were very decoupled. And because of that, all those organizations were measured success was a little bit different, right? They may say, well, I gave a bunch of money to X storage vendor and they gave us some free disks and it's awesome. Or I was able to keep the site up and running because I had this cool uh, make file that fixed everything and blasted out but the rest of the team understood how it worked. So again, everyone had kind of different, different measures of success. And we'll talk about how DevOps tries to attempt to unite those as, as best as we can. Uh, when I started at Square, uh, I was employee number eight. Square is a financial startup. We started in, in Jack's apartment. It's a little thing that plugs into your iPhone and takes credit cards. Um, we also started a company called Twitter. And in that environment, you know, frankly, Jack had a lot of baggage from Twitter, right? That had a lot of fail whales, it had a lot of infrastructure problems. And so when I came into that organization, I said, we are going to run automation throughout the entire stack for our monitoring, for our network, for operations, compute, everything. And I said, we are going to use a modern tool. And at that point, uh, we used Puppet. Puppet failed at Twitter in its first deployment, right? He, he, he totally freaked out, um, but it was actually very successful and it made the organization um, very transparent through the development community. All developers knew what the operations folks were doing and, and vice versa. Um, we repeated that at, at, at Tumblr. Uh, Tumblr was an environment where they had a lot of infrastructure and a public cloud provider. It was very expensive. They needed to move into their own wholesale data center. So they couldn't even do retail. They needed basically a half a megawatt of power capacity. So they couldn't go to an Equinix or a Telex. They had to go straight to a wholesale data center. And if you can imagine that, 
If you're someone like Tumblr that's used to calling an API and getting a server 10 minutes later, that's provisioned with the right SSDs and the right VLANs, right amount of RAM. When you go to a wholesale data center, you don't want to lose that that capacity and that workflow. And so we had to mimic exactly what they would get from that cloud provider in our own data center. And so we'll talk a little bit about how that, uh, that DevOps mindset made that possible. One thing that's interesting to note here is that at both Square and Tumblr, um, these are not organizations that are pushing terabits of traffic, right? They're not Netflix, uh, but Square networking is really important, right? If, if that credit card transaction doesn't work, someone doesn't make money. Right. With, with Tumblr, right, if, if people can't get their posts out there, there are huge ad campaigns, animated cat pictures, that sort of thing, that won't get out to the internet <laughs> if, if Tumblr is not operational. So these are tens of gigabits networks, but not, but not, ter not terabits. And one of the things that we did that was different there is we hired traditional sysadmins and taught them networking. Right? And they approached that the same way they approached any other project, which is evaluate the technologies, do a prototype, make it repeatable or scalable in terms of automation, monitor it, document it, and move on to the next thing. Right? When I was at those organizations, I never hired a full-time network engineer, just like we never hired a full-time database person or a full-time tools developer. You were expected to know all those, those sorts of uh, uh, tools and technologies, as, as JR mentioned, kind of a, a cloud administrator, if you will. Now, one of the things to point out here is that we don't expect a, a generalist sysadmin or a cloud administrator to build a large MPLS service provider network. That's, that's not within scope, right? But, but scripting, MySQL application, um, virtualization technologies, those are all within scope. You're all expected to, to know that at, at this time. DevOps is, is a really loaded word, and, and I'm trying to define it down to its uh, kind of basic components, if you will. And one of the things that I've noticed throughout my career is that more and more layers of the stack are within scope at this point. So you used to be able to say, hey, I can ping, ICMP is cool, it's not my problem. Go talk to someone else. Uh, I haven't been able to say that excuse in about 16 years. It doesn't work anymore, right? You're involved in the application layer to say, hey, your JavaScript's failing, or hey, your DNS is slow, have you considered a CDN, or oh, your CSS isn't compiled right for the DOM in that browser. You can imagine the application layer is all within scope, let alone all the other layers below that, right? Oh, the routing's not working right, there's disk latency, did you run top, did you run free, et cetera. Those are all within scope at this point. And so when you look at a, a cloud or an infrastructure admin, it's taking all layers of the stack within scope. With the result that when you're trying to troubleshoot, you have a cluster meeting. Yes, well, ideally, if you know about all these components, right, you can debug them step by step. Where when we had those silo worlds, you had to say, okay, I've got to reach out to this person that doesn't want to work with me. Um, and I want to try to define, you know, where, and, and my definition of, of DevOps is, is not, it's not a religious thing. It's not a, uh, a movement, if you will. Uh, I like one of Yvonne's comments that it's, that it's a lifestyle. And for me, it's really shared responsibilities. That's what it comes down to at the end of the day. It's not that the network team and the operations team and the storage team and the business team and the marketing team are all writing everything in Ansible. That's not DevOps, right? They may have beer together, they may joke together, they may play foosball together, and that counts, right, as working together in their environments. And again, that shared responsibility. It's the worst thing I hate about the DevOps movement when it applies to networking, as a lot of folks like to say, all networking engineers need to learn Python. They have to learn Python and be able to write scripts from scratch. And I think that's completely wrong. I can drive a car, but if I open the hood, I have no idea what's going on underneath there. Right? I can replace the windshield wipers, I can take out the stereo, I can clean the carpets, but I'm not going to pop the lid and try to debug this thing. That's not my capability there. So I think it's very important that we frame DevOps as you know, a shared responsibility and a generally kind of a common mind share. To the, the product point here is that we preserve these existing data printing protocols. We're not throwing out BGP or OSPF. We're keeping the protocols that you can fire up in Wireshark and figure out what's going on. Uh, but we are trying to do a, a modern approach to the control of the management plane. And as Dinesh mentioned, you know, we try to enable that ecosystem not only for our customers, but for our partners. Right? So we want to fit within that Linux framework. Um, you know, when, I, when I started here, JR said something along the lines of, when someone does a Google search and they say, uh, Linux changed duplex, that resulting Google result should apply to our platform. 
And that's one of the things we strive for is that your Linux knowledge should apply immediately to our platform. We shouldn't have a bunch of specific commands that are only within our version of Linux or a limited busy box shell. It should be the exact same experience you would have on an Ubuntu system or a RHEL system or a Debian system. So we'll talk about some of the technologies um, that enable uh, this kind of DevOps mindset. And I like to call this from loading dock to production. And this is what most people never talk about, right? If you talk to a large cloud provider, they will sell you bandwidth and storage, you know, per an hour and all this great stuff, but they will never talk about how they go from taking all this infrastructure and making it available to the mass market. And so we've tried to um, essentially take some of the baggage that we've learned throughout the industry and try to make things a little bit uh, better and move the needle a little bit further. And one of them is, is Oni. Um, I classically say it's, it's Pixie that doesn't suck. Um, when I was at Square and Tumblr, <laughs> it's not as good as Dinesh's uh, baby comments. I'll try that. Um, I don't have any offspring, but you know, one day. Um, really what this comes down to is if you look at any modern Pixie environment, right, most people will chain boot to iPixie or gpixie because the built-in Pixie client's a joke, right? And then they have to use something like Cobbler or Foreman or the 20 other versions of software that generates their DTP config and their TFTP config. It's just such a mess in that infrastructure. And, and it's great networking, right? It's networking you can do on Arduino, right? IPv4, single-threaded TFTP. That's unacceptable. I grew up in a generation that's like, where's my IPv6? Where'd I get all these great IPs, right? Um, you can't do that with Pixie. So with Oni, what we're doing is preserving the uh, standard bootloader on the platform. So if it's a PowerPC platform, it will be U-Boot. Um, if it's x86, it'll be a standard BIOS, like an award or an open source BIOS, like core BIOS or CBIOS. Uh, and then we add this additional binary, uh, which is Oni. Oni is basically like a small open WRT. So it's a small Linux distribution. It's about three and a half megabytes. Um, and it's basically a bunch of bash scripts. It's super easy uh, to debug and understand how it works. Um, this is on, on GitHub. This is under the open compute effort, uh, which is the, the initiative that originally started from Facebook for uh, open hardware. Great thing about Oni is that it's completely backwards compatible with an environment uh, that is a Pixie standard environment. So it'll use DTP4 and it will source a file from TFTP, no problem. Uh, but if you want to do more exciting things, it can support that. Um, I knew I was going to be short on time for a demo, so I just have some screenshots here. Um, again, U-Boot, the traditional bootloader you would see in embedded platforms like PowerPC or ARM. In this case, we're showing an example where this is a box you received off the loading dock straight from uh, one of our suppliers on the HCL, right? And so Oni will go into this, this uh, unattended mode. Part of the goal of Oni is that I want to get rid of console cables. I think they're a joke. We shouldn't be using them in this century. It's, just, it, it's ridiculous. Um, there's driver problems and pinouts and all this other stuff. It's completely unacceptable. It's like the, the layer two of you know, console cables. It's just a huge mess there. And so one of our goals was how do we make Oni usable to be unattended, but also be monitored on the network. How do you monitor the state of what's going on? With Pixie, right, you get some output on the local console. If you're lucky, you've got the BIOS doing console redirection, and that's about it, right? If you got the control S in time, maybe you can change some settings, but there's really no feedback. Uh, with Oni, we actually fire up uh, SSH, uh, a telnet server. If you give us a DHCP response of a syslog mm -hmm. server, we'll log the syslog. Um, and of course, you can still use a console. It's still there. You can tail files and do DF and all that sort of thing. One of the things that, that I really like about Oni is that you know, it enables that, that mindset of DevOps where I want to have power and control into the user. And if you look at a lot of the frameworks that exist uh, with Pixie, again, they're chain booting to add enhancements because the standard Pixie client can only get a single file of a TFTP. So they'll chain boot to iPixie so they can say, okay, let me send the MAC address as a query string so I know, okay, it's X server, give it a, a Red Hat, you know, <laughs> kickstart file or give it an Ubuntu pre-seed file. You're, you're chaining things on to get that, that capability. With Oni, we build it right in. So if you want to do an HTTP request, we give you all these uh, request headers. So you can imagine, you can say, okay, for X platform, a, uh, a Dell S4000, I want to give you know, Cumulus Linux 2.5. You can control that response. Um, it's very flexible. Again, very easy protocols that most folks um, understand. When it downloads an image, again, it's an unattended operation. Uh, it basically extracts the image and then does the, the installation. Again, completely unattended. Um, our installer uh, is pretty simple. Um, Oni has MakeFS and a few commands there that it can, you know, that's available to it. Um, other vendors could do a, a K-exec or something like that to get additional functionality 
Uh, but Oni is basically, again, just a small busy box distribution to enable the installation of a network operating system completely unattended in a modern fashion. So when it completes its installation, again, U-Boot does the initial initialization of, of the system. It changes the state machine, so now we're booting from uh, the local hard drive or compact flash or NAND flash or CF, whatever uh, the flash is. Any questions on Oni? I know there was a lot of people that wanted to talk about Oni for some reason, but it's just a bootloader, nothing too exciting. <laughs> <laughs> but Pixie does, still sucks. So, um, <laughs> so let's, let's talk about ZTP. Um, this one's, this is a shout out to Yvonne here, which I think was gonna say, everyone has ZTP. How is your ZTP better? Um, well, our ZTP is not prescriptive, right? When you look at zero touch provisioning on other platforms, it's I can download a config file to put into my CLI based upon my MAC address. Well, first of all, you have to know the MAC address ahead of time. There's one PK and other things, we have some more flexibility there. But because we're Linux, we can fetch a script and we can do whatever you want in a script, right? Who can so, Arista, by the way? <laughs> Right. Um, awesome. That's good. That's great. <laughs> and their market cap is what, four and a half billion today or something like that? Maybe our market cap should be three and a half billion because they got there a day early. <laughs> One of the things that's the difference between us and Arista is that you can install software, you know, that we've made available on the platform that, that's there, that's resident there, but also you can add, say, Debian.org as an app get repo and then get 40,000 packages. So on Arista, you may say, hey, I really love Go. That's the language of our organization. If Arista or Cisco or Juniper hasn't said, oh, we've got enough customers that have complained for the lack of Go, you don't have an option there. I think that's one of the challenges that you have with the traditional platforms is that they're trying to fit within this ecosystem, but they've cherry picked. It's this language and that automation tool. And that's completely unacceptable in the DevOps world. You get to pick the tool that your organization is, is comfortable with. So in the ZTP example here, basically it's very similar to Oni. We do a DHCP request on, on the management interface. We look for a response with a URL. We fetch a script. Uh, we execute that. It's running as UID zero root, so it can do things like, say, install some SSH keys or set up Puppet, run Puppet the first time, uh, that sort of thing. So we'll just walk through really quickly what that looks like. Again, standard DHCP config. You have a response that's a, a URL that it can fetch. It basically uses a W get or curl to, to fetch that. When it fetches the script, uh, before it executes, it looks for a little kind of like a sanity string, if you will. So obviously running a script as, as root is, is good times. Uh, and this example here, we're basically adding an additional software repository, again, showing the, the power of, of Cumulus. If you don't like the software we have, add your own. Like a lot of people don't like Quagga, they can install Bird or write their own. It's totally up to them. Um, so in this example, we're installing some, some ASCII art uh, software called Figlet. We're setting um, the host name uh, of the, uh, the system. I'd do that. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, this is not like this is a, a funny example. If customers would do exactly this. Um, uh, all the time. And then of course we put a license uh, to enable all the, those ports to, to actually work. And so when this is done, right, it oh. does the ASCII art, something I've always done in my jobs is put a born on date, you know, like a, like a bud can, right, do the same thing on, on your hardware there. Um, it's very simple. So you, again, you can take that, that methodology you're doing on compute and, and apply it uh, to the networking side. Uh, classic, classic question, and I did a lot of arm wrestling with JR when I started here. It's like, why don't you have a CLI? You've got to have all this huge market segment of folks that, that are going to be scared. And one of the things that's really interesting is that if you look at the penetration of you know, CCIEs and folks that know networking, huge, huge segment of the market. But there's also a lot of folks that know Linux, right? And I think a great example of this is when you go from, say, Junos to, well, sorry, when you go from like iOS to Junos, right? You may be the only person in your organization that's made that step or vice versa, right? If you go to Linux, you know, nine times out of 10, someone in your company has probably touched Linux, right? They've got a Raspberry Pi, or they built a NAS at home, or they have some interaction with it. Maybe they've used actual Unix back in the day, like SunOS or SGI, those sorts of things. People have some experience with it. They can say, oh yeah, go learn VI, that's gonna be good times, you know? Or, oh yeah, you should go learn Ed if you're really statistic, right? Those sorts of things. <laughs> um, they cat and control D is enough for me. Exactly, exactly. So it could be just that simple of, well, the, the, the shell is powerful enough for me. Um, so I think that's one of the things that's, that's important to note here is that you know, we see Bash as, as, as the common CLI in our platform, but as, again, as Dinesh quickly showed in, in his graphics and certainly with JR, we enable other partners to do management suites on, on top of the product. So you know, we don't expect a, a typical customer to say, okay, I'm gonna buy 100 switches and I'm still gonna treat it like I treat a Cisco device and log into each one individually. You would apply whatever you're doing on compute 
to the network, right? So on the compute side, you may say, oh, we really love Ansible, and that's how we blast out configs. That's no problem. You can do that on our platform. Uh, there's no issue there. Um, if you picked, you know, Puppet or Chef or something like that, again, it's really up to you. We want to mimic what you're doing on the compute side and, and apply it to networking. Another example is that, you know, we're a fork of Debian. Uh, I think that's pretty well understood, just like uh, Ubuntu is. And one of the things that's great about this is that we definitely take advantage of their, uh, their base distribution, right? Great thing about Debian is that, like, architecture cross compatibility just works, right? They've been doing x86, PowerPC, ARM, 32 bit, SGI, all those sort of crazy exotic platforms. They've been doing it for a long time. So we can take advantage of some of that QA. Uh, but more importantly, when they move forward, we will move with them. Right? I think that's very important. When you look at something like Junos, that's a fork of a FreeBSD, and they have not moved forward, right? They took it as a, as a control plane, basic OS, but all the advantages you get with a, a modern Linux platform, they don't get. Same thing with you know, uh, uh, Arista, right? It was a fork of, of Fedora, and they haven't moved forward. And so we want, again, if, we, if we're going to mimic that experience that you have in compute, we can't say, well, you have to run a six-year-old version of Puppet because we have an old version of Ruby and an old version of LibC and blah, blah, blah. And we want those same tools, the same experience uh, that you would have there. So the classic example of this is, will you guys go to System D? If Debian does, so will we. Right? We want to take advantage of that QA and that user base as, as best as we can. And we've actually seen a lot of great examples of this. One of the initiatives I've been working on is getting all of our daemons to have structured data in and out. Um, and one of the structures is, is JSON, very sort of hip uh, in the programming uh, world. LLDP control, an open source program, we didn't write it, upstream added LLDP, uh, sorry, added JSON support in the daemon, that's great. We can just upgrade to that version and, and take advantage of that. Now we have added this to IF down two, our, our, our fork of IF down two. Um, and we will add this to other programs. Our monitoring program that does LM sensors data also can dump in, in JSON format. And eventually, hopefully, we'll, we'll get Quag and other, other um, software suites to follow the this, this structured context. Yes, basic JSON support already, not as input, but as output. As output, exactly. Yes, of yesterday? No. <laughs> yeah, and I'd like to make a clarification on, on the experimental label. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, this, this is a funny. This is, this is a funny story. So when when I got here, we actually listed Debian.org as our app get repo, and I was like, my God, that's crazy! I can install R or Mathematica or anything that's in this forty thousand uh, package repository. And as we matured the organization, we said, you know, we're less than hundred people we're not gonna be able to support 40,000 packages. That's unrealistic. Um, so we have our own set of app get repositories. The three main repositories are main updates and security updates. And those are the same base set of about 300 packages. So that's Quagga, LDP, VI, Perl, Python, Ruby, uh, SwitchD, all the kind of standard components. And those are 100% supported. If you have a problem with any of those, eventually they'll wake up JR Dinesh if it has to go that, that far down the line. 100% supported. We have additional re repositories of add-ons. So this is third-party software we didn't write. Like, we don't write Ansible, we don't write Puppet, we don't write Chef. Now, we may have given them patches to detect our operating system or maybe enhancements, but we don't write that software. So add-ons are basically best effort uh, support, where we tend to have a relationship with that organization, but we didn't write the software. And that last repository is experimental, right? So experimental may, could literally be, as Dinesh pointed out, it's not oh, Dinesh had this idea one week and just you know, pumped out some code. It was a customer said, hey, I have this problem. Can you solve it for me? We talked about it and made a solution to see if it works for them. And one of the things that's interesting about experimental is that we can introduce new technologies um, for customers to adopt and test and make sure that they're comfortable with it. Now, if we could take advantage of the, uh, the Debian uh, repository, if we could put software in there, that would be a great QA resource. But we don't want to have our customers do QA, right? That's, that's our job. And so I think it's a very important distinction that experimental is turned off by default. You had to explicitly turn on that repository. And it's very well understood as part of our support organization what's, what's a first class uh, package and daemon that we support versus, oh, this is Dineshware, if you will. Um, <laughs> Dineshware. <laughs> Great. Um, we're running a little bit out of time here. So I want to uh, make sure we have more time for, for David here. 
uh, in the demo, and I think we'll, we'll do an overview of the demo uh, when, when, we, uh, when folks walk out here because we're getting uh, short on time. But the topology and the approach for the demo is our OpenStack solution guide. So if you go on the website, you can download the documentation and, and the files for this. And basically what we're doing is we've got um, two switches and three servers that are all plugged into a management network, an out-of-band network. And all the servers are set for Pixie. Um, boot, so they only boot with Pixie. They don't have a hard drive uh, listed for their, their boot options. We stick a USB stick that has Cumulus Linux, uh, ZTP scripts, shell scripts, everything uh, in the first switch. And Oni will come up in a mode that says, okay, is there a management network that I can fetch an image from? Nope, there's not. Oh, there's a USB stick and it has a file name that looks like something that's compatible with Oni let me install an operating system unattended. So the first Genesis switch is sourced from a USB stick. When it's finished running uh, the, inst the installer, uh, Cumulus Linux comes up and ZTP detects, hey, I've got a USB stick with a shell stick, let me run this. It sets up DHCPD, it sets up a web server, um, it sets up various files. So the second switch and X number of switches can then be booted off the management network and, and get up and going. Um, we detected the, the topology uh, via LLDP. Um, and when we actually blast out the uh, Nova components and Glance and everything else, uh, we're using Puppet for that. Uh, one of the things that's, that's interesting about this is that um, we took kind of a, I guess, a strong arm approach to this of if I was a user and I didn't work at Cumulus Linux, how would I make this possible? And so we made the bar like as low as possible. One of them is that we didn't install any additional software. So in our distribution today, we don't ship with a web server. We ship with Python, and you can make Python into a web server, right? We ship with uh, Python, Ruby, uh, uh, Perl, and Bash. We wanted to make the scripts very consumable to, to any user. So all the scripts are written in Bash. They're pretty big, right? Uh, but they're, they're fairly easy to, to walk through. Um, when we discovered the topology, we're using LLDP, we had an older version of the LLDP software that only outputted either human readable or key value pairs. I didn't have this nice JSON that I could parse. I had to do grep and awk and TR and that sort of stuff to get the data that I wanted. Um, what we did have was, was Puppet, a very well-tuned Puppet setup to, to blast out all the configuration uh, for uh, OpenStack. And one of the things that's interesting about this is that it proves that uh, a customer without our support, meaning that we didn't hold their hand, there's enough power and freedom in the platform that if they wanna automate OpenStack they can do it with a bunch of Bash scripts, some Python, and all the software that's, that's there. They didn't have to wait for a third-party software vendor to compile some software for Cumulus. They didn't have to wait and say, oh, did we add Salt or Go or something like that. They could do it with all the infrastructure that's, that's in the platform today. Any other questions on Oni, ZTP? I'm supposed to be the, the DevOps you know, hoodie one here, so. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I, I'm just getting a crazy idea. So with this approach of yours, and together with Dell and their logistics, just kidding, just kidding. you could just uh, have an online application where you would uh, build your leaf and spine fabric, press deliver, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Generate the file that you put on the USB stick and off it goes to the data center. It's funny you said that yes. because I've, I've had that discussion with really? VMware, Red Hat, Dell, a, a couple other people you'll hear about over the next month or so. So I think you're going to see solutions like that delivered yeah. uh, you know, to customers in the next three, three or four yeah. months. And really what you get out of it is not just the USB stick, but you get the, the cable, man like a, yeah. a bill of materials, mm. cable manifest, plug this into there, you know, lev likely leverage something like PTM to go through and make sure that it's wired up correctly yeah, and exactly cool. uh, Dell has something like that but because they're traditional it has to run a, on a VM and push the configs down and everything and you can automate everything right yeah now we've seen this from a, a couple different perspectives one was can we make a like a zip file generator where you go to a website and say okay I have XYZ config give me a zip file that I can DD over to a USB stick and, and it's good yeah. to go. Uh, one of the things that's, that's, that's neat about Cumulus is that we have an organization called Customer Engineering and uh, Nat Morris actually prototyped an example of this where he literally has a, an HTML5 app where you drag and drop all the switches, hit the button and it generates a PTM config. Right, so we would love to get that out to market, as, as JR mentions, w with the right partner. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, we're a foundational OS. We can do all these great, you know, Dineshwar hacks, if, if you will, but it's really enabled by partners and, <laughs> and customer demand.